Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. I hear that you've been looking over the last six weeks at one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. You've been looking at Acts 19. If you've missed it, if you're new today, then uh, Acts 19 is Paul coming to the ancient city of Ephesus, spending three years there, 53 AD to 55 AD. And the church has spent the last six weeks looking at what happened when Paul, on pretty much on his own, he's got a very small team, rocks into town, massive city, 250,000 free men and women, 400,000 slave, slaves and slave women. So it's a city of two-thirds of a million people. Paul and a few friends turn up and, man, they rock the city. So if you've been here the last six weeks, you'll have heard all about it. The first few verses, uh, Paul arrives, he finds about a dozen believers who know very little about Jesus and even less about the Holy Spirit. He sorts them out, starts the church on a good footing. Uh, he goes into the next few verses where uh, Paul starts sharing the good news of Jesus in the synagogues, in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, uh, kind of just reasoning with people who have no believing background in Jesus, telling them about Jesus and just seeing Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people saved. It carries on, verse 11 to 16, you suddenly get an outbreak of miracles. And I mean amazing miracles, where people are getting healed left, right and centre of the most amazing conditions, which then moves into revival in the city. So uh, people come and they basically bring all their dodgy books. They get convicted that they've got all this stuff they shouldn't be looking at at home. I guess today it would be maybe even DVD collections, CDs, bring in their hard drives of their computers and they just burn them in the middle of Ephesus. And it says it costs 50,000 drachmas, all that they burn, which is 10 million pounds worth of stuff. So either they were really bad people or there were a lot of them. And it, it seems that Paul like, arrives in this massive city with just a handful of team members. And within less than three years, there are literally tens and tens of thousands of believers in Jesus. And you can find it quite encouraging, or you can just find it a little bit depressing. You can think, well, we've been trying to build this church in Brighton for years. And here he is with a few friends, a couple of years. It's all kicking off. And then the series was called... Uh, uh, was all, I predict a riot, and the end of Acts 19 is this massive riot, and uh, they're protesting, and the reason they're protesting is his enemies basically say, large numbers of people here in Ephesus, and in practically the whole province of Asia, are turning to Jesus. It's not that they're just changing the city, Paul and his friends are changing the entire region. Jesus writes the book of Revelation. He kind of inspires John to write down this letter he writes to seven churches. One of them's Ephesus. The other six are churches that were planted through Ephesus. You think, how on earth did Paul and his friends manage to come to a city and totally transform it? I think the danger, if we just stopped with Acts 19, is you start thinking that Paul is like some superhuman missionary machine. And if, you're not a, if you are a Christian, it's a bit discouraging because you basically put Paul on a pedestal. You think it's brilliant that Paul used a guy like him, but God could never do that through me. And if you're not a Christian, it could be even more discouraging because you kind of come here, maybe a friend drags you to come to church or actually just off your own back, you thought, I, I really want to find out if this stuff is true. And you come here, might not be your first time, you might have been here several times thinking, is this true? Could I follow Jesus? What would it mean for me? And sometimes it's just not helpful to read about Paul doing these amazing things and thinking, I really don't think I could do that. Which is why I'm so grateful for Ephesians. This morning we're starting a series called What Kind of Church from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is the letter which Paul wrote to Ephesus, hence the name Ephesians. He wrote it five years after he left Ephesus. He's writing from Rome in 60 AD. And for me, this is the reason I get excited rather than slightly discouraged when I read Acts 19 and discover what Paul did in Ephesus. Because this is the letter which describes why Paul was able to do what he did in the city and why the church went on to do such amazing things in the city that they were. That's why we're going to spend quite a few weeks in the book of Ephesus, in the book of Ephesians, to discover kind of underneath the skin, if you're not a Christian, underneath the skin of what it means to follow Jesus. 
if you are a Christian, underneath the skin of what it means to be saved, to be a Christian. If you're part of this church and you're, you're really engaged with the mission of reaching a, a, an unreached city with the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's a letter which gets under the skin of how churches change cities. For me, it's like, I love the, it's a bit of an old movie now, but I really love the Terminator movies. And I love the uh, Terminator 2 the second one where uh, John Connor, the little boy, is about to be killed by the evil Terminator. And he finally, he finally spots him in a corridor. He gets his gun out. He loads. He's just about to fire loads and loads of bullets into this helpless boy. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, the good Terminator, suddenly arrives, leaps into the corridor, grabs John Connor, hugs him to his chest, turns his back on the bad Terminator takes about 20 bullets in the back and then they go off and it's all right. He then demonstrates to the boy that he's got this kind of metal endoskeleton and he's all all right and you're watching it thinking, I'm loving this movie because he's totally different from me. I'm, love, I, I'm not going to try and pretend that I'm like Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is just a completely different category of being. That's why I love Ephesus. I love the letter to the Ephesians, because it's the city where we know most about Paul at his best, and it's the city where we've got a letter which explains why Paul was at his best. I tell you, let's just kick off this series together by reading the first few verses. we just read the first six verses of Ephesians together this morning. I love what it says about what it's like to follow Jesus under the skin, to be part of a church under the skin of what it really means to be God's people. We're going to uh, just look at these first six verses together. We're going to take communion together. It'll be a chance to respond. If you're not a Christian, it will be a chance for you to say, oh, it's easier than I thought. I'm in. You might take communion this morning for the first time in half an hour's time, saying, because of what Paul explains I know I can do it because it's all about God. It's not about me. You might take communion this morning as a Christian saying, I've always kind of put myself as a championship league Christian or a league one or a league two kind of Christian. And I've suddenly realized it's not that Paul was like some premiership Christian. It's just that he understood the things which he explained. So let me read Ephesians first six verses. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful ones in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the Lord, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him, in Jesus, before the creation of the world, to be homely and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace. I'm just going to pick out six things in these six verses to try and get under the skin of this verse. So I'm going to talk first about what kind of person Paul was. Let's get under the skin of Paul. What kind of person was he? I want to go next under what kind of church was, was, was the church he planted. Let's go under the skin of the church. What kind of message did he preach? Let's go under the skin of the message. What kind of help did he receive from God, from heaven? Let's go under the skin of that. What was his status? What was it? Who did he think he was anyway to turn up at a city like that? Let's just go under the skin of that. And then we'll end with a final verse. What was the purpose of it all? We'll go under the skin of what that was about. So let's just start with what kind of person. This is how Paul begins his letter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. It's just one verse, but it's so rich. This is who Paul thinks he is. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. It's amazing. You... When you have read Acts 19 and you've seen all that God does through Paul and you think, how on earth could God use me like this or my church like this or me and my friends like this? And then you read this. You think, well, it didn't start with Paul rocking up into town. It started with Paul grasping who he was in Jesus Christ. Paul, 
an apostle. The word apostle in Greek, it literally just means sent one. He didn't arrive in Ephesus thinking, how on earth am I going to reach two-thirds of a million people? He arrived in Ephesus thinking, I've been sent here by Jesus Christ. The word apostle also has a technical meaning. Jesus chose 12 apostles. You know, Peter, Andrew, James, John, the other eight. He chose 12 with whom he was going to give special authority to. Paul's going into town saying, I was just as much chosen as those other ones were. I'm here in town with the authority of Jesus Christ. I might look like some kind of foreign out of town who's never going to make a difference in this town. But no, I've been sent here by Christ Jesus. It's more than that. I've been sent here by Christ Jesus by the will of God. It's not just the Son, Jesus the Son who sent him. It's God the Father sent me here. How do you live your life? Because it makes an awful difference. I mean, if you live your life thinking something like, I'm a student here in Brighton, I didn't intend to be, I just didn't get the grades for somewhere else and I ended up here, I'll try and make the most of it, I don't want to get dragged away by my mates for three years, hopefully I'll emerge from university having had a really good time and I'll still have my Christian faith. Contrast that with, I'm in Brighton by the will of God. I applied somewhere else, but God sent me here. The only reason I'm in Brighton is that God, by his sovereign will, sent me here with his authority. And I'm not worried about whether my mates are going to drag me away during my time in Brighton. I'm excited that God, if he sent me here, must have sent me here so I can drag my friends to hear the Christian gospel. It just makes a total difference. You meet people, they say something like, oh, I hate my job. I'm trying to find a different job. Why doesn't God provide me with a different job? I keep praying, God, get me out of this office. If you knew the people I work with, oh, it's terrible. It's all I can do to make it through the week. Contrast that. I'm in this job sent by the will of God. I know it's the will of God because I keep asking him to move me out of this job and he doesn't. So it must be the will of God. (laughs) I'm here. I've tried so many times to leave. doesn't matter how many job applications I do. I don't get them. And I'm quite a good candidate, so it must be the will of God that I stay. And I can tell why it's the will of God that I stay, because my work colleagues don't half need to hear about Jesus. And they're the kind of people who probably wouldn't go to church unless someone from this church went there Monday to Friday. I mean, it makes a total difference, doesn't it? If you're a mum and you're stuck at home and you're thinking, oh, my life was so good until the kids came along and it's just got so small and a big social gathering for me is posting on Facebook. (laughs) I've got small kids. I know what it's like. It's a real difference to I am a mother or a father sent by the will of God to this stage in my life. I'm not going to complain that I can't do all the things I did when I didn't have kids. I'm going to enjoy the fact I've got a decade where I can't do a whole lot without kids. And it's all right. Because I am sent by the will of God to train up the next generation that when I'm dead, in the grave, doing nothing, they will be continuing to shape this city for God. It just makes a total difference. This is how Paul arrives in town. It's only the first verse, but you think, this is how he made a difference. This is what it's like to get under the skin of Paul. You kind of understand what's going on. You're going to enjoy this series through the book of Ephesians. I just recommend a book to you. I don't agree with it in every place, but it's it's the best book I've ever read on Ephesians. It's written by a Chinese guy in the 1940s called Watchman Nee, and it's called Sit, Walk, Stand. It's very, very short, but very, very challenging. He basically says the first three chapters of Ephesians are sit, It's all about who you are in Jesus Christ. Just rest in who you are. That's why Paul made such a difference. He didn't go to Ephesus with anything to prove. He didn't go hoping that, you know, he'd make it into the book of Acts and that people would be preaching about him in 2,000 years' time. He just went resting in the grace of God and in who he'd become in Jesus Christ. First three chapters, sit. Next two and a half chapters, chapter 4, 5, and the first half of chapter 6, Watchman Nee says, well, that's walk. It's all about because you are this in Christ, you can walk this way day to day. And then the final half of the chapter, he calls it stand. He says, because of who you are in Jesus Christ, you can stand against the enemy. You can win any spiritual battle 
because of who you are in Jesus. So these, this first half of the letter is where the meat is. It's where the, it's where the action is. And we've got to get through this if we're going to make a difference in the cities where we live. If you really want to affect Brighton, you have to get who you are in Jesus Christ. It's absolutely essential. You have to understand this. See, we live in a culture that kind of glorifies Paul, don't we? We Christian culture would put him on a pedestal, would say, well, of course it can't be like that. That was the apostolic age. Don't be unrealistic. Paul could do those things, but not us. We make him out to be some superhuman. And yet in Acts 14, he actually fights that very thing. People start worshipping him. They, it says, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted, the gods have come down to us in human form. When Paul heard this, he tore his clothes, rushed into the crowd and shouted, men, why are you doing this? We're only human, just like you. I love Ephesians. It's basically Paul saying, I'm only human. I'm just a normal guy. I'm an apostle, sure, but I'm sent by the same Jesus Christ who sent you, by the, same, by the will of the same God who wills things in your life. I'm coming to, I went to a city just like you go to a city. I'm just a normal person. You've got to understand what's on the inside. The inside of the person. Paul He knows he's an apostle. He knows he's in town for a reason. He's got a sense of destiny that Jesus Christ has sent him by the will of God the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit to make a difference. Secondly, what kind of church? To the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. If you've just read Acts 19, you're tempted to think, no, Paul, no, no, no. No, we've, we've read Acts 19. There's no need to pretend. We know what they're like. We read about the first dozen members of this church, how they didn't really know very much about Jesus. They kind of hadn't even got around to getting baptized. And when they were asked if they'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit, they said, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. I mean, they were about as bad as it gets. Paul, stop bigging them up. We know what it's really like. Paul's saying, no, no, no. I'm not talking about what they're like in and of themselves. I'm talking about who they are. Now they've been saved by Jesus Christ. You, you got it all wrong. You've got your focus all on yourselves. You need to get your focus on who, who we are in Jesus Christ. Take your focus off us. Put your focus on Jesus. You begin to discover how the church at Ephesus viewed itself. See, it's really interesting, isn't it? How you view yourself really affects what you do, doesn't it? How a church views itself makes a massive difference. This is how the church in Ephesus viewed themselves. We're saints. We're the faithful. The same word, Greek word, pistos, can also mean we're faith-filled. It can mean both things, which generally means it does mean both things. So they're saying, we're saints. We've been made completely... We're not worshipping Paul on a pedestal. We're saints ourselves. God's done exactly the same thing in our life that he did in Paul's life. We're faithful. Of course we're faithful. We didn't begin our Christian walk, so we're certainly not worried about whether we're going to quit our Christian walk. It's all about him. And we're faith-filled because we look at ourselves, and instead of looking at ourselves and saying, we're not good enough, we look at ourselves and say, not only are we not good enough, we're not even good enough to do the stuff we're already doing. Even what we're doing is the Holy Spirit, not us. And so you look at yourself and you think, well, of course we could do what Paul did. Because I can't even do what I'm currently doing. So if I can't do what I'm doing, then I can certainly do what I'm still not doing. The Holy Spirit's at work. They get it. See, if Paul were writing to Brighton, he wouldn't write, Dear Church of Christ the King, hope you're doing well. He would write, To the saints in Shoreham. To the faithful at Brighton Racecourse. To those who are full of faith at the New England site. That's how we'd write it. That's how we need to write it if we're going to change our city. You see, how you view yourself makes a massive, massive difference. Even this, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Did you get that? Paul's basically writing to the Ephesians saying, you live two places, not one. You've got two postcodes, not just one. Sure, you live in Ephesus, but you also live in Christ Jesus makes a massive difference. I live in a community in London where lots of people live both in my community and in a few villages in Pakistan. They will have family links and they will spend some of the year back in Pakistan, some of the year in London. 
If you say to them, where do you live? They say, I live two places. I live in Pakistan. I live in England. If you hang out with them in England, they don't act like every other English person. There's a whole lot of Pakistani about them. If you see them in Pakistan, the Pakistanis would say they don't act like us. There's a whole lot of Englishmen about them. Why? Because they're living in two places. Paul says, I'm writing to you who are in Ephesus and in Christ Jesus. If Paul were writing to you, he'd say to the saints in Brighton and in Christ Jesus. You've got to grasp this thing that the Christian gospel is not just get your sins forgiven and Jesus will probably let you into heaven if you don't blow it too much. The gospel is this. The gospel is that we can be added into Christ and can be right now, even though our bodies are on earth, we can be in the Spirit, seated with Christ in heavenly places, right now at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, whilst also living in Brighton. And Jesus, this is the other aspect of the gospel, Jesus is still seated right next to God the Father, but he also lives in Brighton because he lives in us. It makes a total difference. Paul's not arriving in town thinking, I'm just one guy. How am I going to change the city of two-thirds of a million people? He's arriving in town thinking, well, I live in heaven, and I've got everything I need in heaven, and Jesus lives in me, and Jesus is really quite good at changing cities. So because I live in heaven with Jesus, and Jesus lives in Ephesus with me, it's going to be all right. That's how the Christian life is. Uh, I'm an out-of-towner. I'm an outsider. So I just like coming and hearing about the things you're doing at the moment. I love to hear about the plan for a fourth site, for doing up Clarendon Centre, if I, for doing up Clarendon Villas. If I were part of the church, I'd be giving. It's so exciting. And not for a moment would I be thinking, what if it doesn't work? Not for a moment. Not for a moment would I be thinking, haven't we already given enough people away to the other two sites? Not for a moment. Not for a moment would I be thinking, the price is too high. I would just be thinking, I live in Brighton. And Jesus lives in Brighton with me. And I live in heaven with Jesus. This thing's going to fly. Why? Because we're the saints in Brighton and in Christ Jesus. That's what the church in Ephesus is like. This is a church which impacted the world. Why? Because they grasped who they were in Jesus Christ. What kind of message? Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, of course it's the grace of God, isn't it? Of course it's the grace of God. You don't really think that Paul was so good in his own strength that he was able to transform a city like that, do you? That would be fairy tales. The Bible isn't fairy tales. The Bible is just an account of what happens when people live in heaven with Jesus and Jesus lives on earth with them to change a city. Of course it's the grace of God all the time. It's, we tend to look at Acts and look at the life of Paul and think, well, God couldn't really use us like that. That was Paul. No, you, you're missing the point. Your problem is not that you're not as good as Paul. Your problem is that you don't realize you're as bad as Paul. See, Paul realized he was bad. It was easy for him. He'd been persecuting the church for years. He'd probably murdered Christians as part of that. He had fumed against Jesus Christ. He'd blasphemed the name of God for years before he became a Christian. He had no doubt. He describes himself in one of his letters written to Ephesus, uh, a different letter. He describes himself as the worst of sinners. Your problem is not that you think that you're not good enough to be like Paul. The problem is that you think you're better than you really are. Paul's breakthrough was basically getting to a point where he thinks, I'm going to go to Ephesus and there is absolutely nothing I'm going to be able to do to change the city. But God wants to use people like me because of his grace. Would you do that? Would you do that as a church? Would you say, actually, we're, we're going to see great things for God, not because we think we're something in God, but because we know we're nothing without God? Would you be the kind of church which lives and breathes this message. I'll tell you how I know this was Paul's lifetime message. He wrote 13 letters in the New Testament. All 13 of them begin with either this exact phrase or a one exceedingly similar to it. This is just the way Paul begins his letters. Grace, peace, because that's my message. Grace from God the Father, grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. Fourth thing, what kind of help? Because we're going to need it, aren't we? I'm amazed at what God's done through you. I, I like coming in and out of churches because I think the last time I came here was two years ago. Uh, so it's nice to see, almost like not be so caught up in the day-to-day -day detail that you don't notice the change. 
So I am amazed at what you've done as a church in the last two years. I'm amazed about you launching these two new sites. I'm amazed about what you've done here in the New England site. I'm amazed at what you've done in terms of planning the next stage, the next site. I'm amazed at what God's done through you. What kind of help are you going to need for this next stage? Quite a lot. About the same amount that Paul did. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every blessing in Christ. Every blessing in Christ. And I just love the tense here, really. I get, I get quite excited even about just the subtle things about what the Bible says. It doesn't say God will bless us with every blessing in Christ. It says God has blessed us. See, Paul's not there fighting with God in prayer saying, if only God would change the city, please let me get some blessing. That's why it's sit, walk, stand. He's just there knowing, I have been given every blessing. I've got, it. I've got every blessing I need for the city of Brighton. I've got it all in the heavenly places. I just need to bring it down to earth. There's no doubt over whether God wants to give this church everything it needs to reach and change the city of Brighton. No doubt whatsoever. The question is just laying hold of it in heaven and bringing it down to earth. That's why Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. As it already is in heaven. Being a Christian isn't about getting stuff from God. If you're a Christian, you've got it all from God. It's a case of laying hold of what you've already got. That's really important if you're not a Christian. So many people I chat to, they say, I'd really like to follow Jesus. I just look around at other people. I think, I just couldn't live this way. I've got this issue in my life or this thing I'd really struggle to let go of. I, I don't feel I could follow Jesus. You've got to understand, following Jesus is about receiving every spiritual blessing in Christ. God gives you everything you need. You need to be pastored. You need to be part of a church, a church which will help you to understand how do you lay hold of what you've already got and live in the good of it on earth, sure. But it's not about you kind of committing to following Jesus and then gritting your teeth and then trying hard for the rest of your life. Rubbish. It's about having everything you need from day one in Jesus Christ and learning how to lay hold of it every single day. I love it. This, this phrase, in Christ, is used eight times in the opening 14 verses of Ephesians. This phrase, in heavenly places, in the heavenly, heavenly realms, is used five times in the book of Ephesians. These are big themes. Paul's saying, if you want to understand how churches change cities, if you want to understand what kind of help churches and individuals need to live the Christian life, you've just got to understand two words, in Christ. you got it. It's in Christ. Every heavenly blessing. That's why Paul sees these dozen Ephesians, Ephesian believers. He thinks, how am I going to start a church with 12 people who hardly know about Jesus? They haven't got around to getting baptized probably. They don't understand about the Holy Spirit. It's because it's every spiritual blessing. The Greek can just be translated every blessing of the Holy Spirit. He's just looking at them thinking, well, of course they're looking like this. They haven't received the Holy Spirit. If you haven't received the Holy Spirit, I'd encourage you, make the most of these Holy Spirit afternoons. Make the most of an opportunity to be discipled in how you lay hold of the Holy Spirit so that you can enjoy every spiritual blessing which is already yours. I love it. I love it. He's not worried, are we going to have fruit in Ephesus? He's just thinking, I've been sent by God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit. I can't fail to bear fruit in this city. What kind of status? Verses 4 and 5. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he adopted us as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. This is amazing. <laughs> Let me just take a step back. I just read some simple words in the English language. But these are the kind of words which should make you want to worship if you're a Christian and should make you very excited if you're not a Christian. These are amazing promises from God. Here's what Paul says about you, if you're a believer, God chose you in Jesus before the creation of the world. I, I would settle with God saying to me, I chose you before your mum and dad conceived you. I was born in 1974. If God said to me, I, can, before, I, I chose you in 1973. Before you were even conceived. I, I just think that's amazing, God. You mean it really is about grace? Grace. 
it really is about all you've done and not about what I've done because I hadn't done anything in 1973. I'd, I'd settle for that, but God isn't saying that. He's saying, before I created the world, I chose you. You didn't exist. I knew you would. I chose you. The world didn't exist, but I created it because you needed somewhere to live. It's amazing. We live in a culture which basically thinks we're just random animals living on a random ball of rock, spinning in a random galaxy in the midst of a random universe. And Paul says to us, that is entirely false. You were chosen by God before the creation of the world. In fact, the reason the creation of the world happened was because you were chosen in Christ. God wanted somewhere for you to live. And in fact, the city of Brighton came about because God wanted to bring thousands of people together where he could build a good church and he brought you to be part of it so that you could leave many to know God. This is what Paul thinks when he arrives at Ephesus. He's thinking, well, this is a funny rock formation. This is a very interesting harbour. It almost looks as though God intended a large conurbation to be here. That's what he thinks. He thinks, well, if God has intended this city to be here and he's brought me here by the will of God and he chose me since the beginning of the world, man, we're on an adventure with God together. I love this because it's really practical. I know it's practical for you as a church, but it's really practical even as individuals. One of my friends, um, her, her mum tried to abort her when she was in the womb. And she's now in her late 20s and still struggling with the fact that she knows her mum unsuccessfully tried to terminate the pregnancy. Still, she's still broken up about it. This is the message for her. She's saying, didn't my mum want me? That's not the question. The question is, God wanted you doesn't matter what happened in your past. Even before you were born, you were chosen before the beginning of the world. I've got another friend who her mum and dad weren't married. She was conceived by mistake outside of marriage. And she's still grappling with the fact that nobody really intended her birth. It was just a bit of illicit sex. And she, you know, her mum got pregnant. She's thinking, you know, I wasn't intended. I don't know. She's, again, in her late 20s. Still trying to grapple with this. Listen, she needs to understand. Actually, the issue isn't, did your mum and dad want you? The issue is, God chose you before the beginning of the world. It changes everything. It really changes everything. I chatted with a friend today. He's a, a friend last week. He's a, he's a Christian guy, gay, struggling just with the, the, the feelings he has. He's a Christian trying to work through his discipleship with Jesus. And he said to me, I think he was just being flippant, but he said to me, I have nothing to look forward to in my life but death. So I'm helping him. But I've got to help him with this. That God chose you before the beginning of the world. You're not a mistake. The way you are, even your makeup is not a mistake. God has chosen you. God has predestined you. God has brought you to this place because he's got great plans for your life. It's amazing. People look at this doctrine of election, God choosing. They say, well, it's not really fair. Does that mean that God chose me and not others? Simple answer, Paul doesn't tell us. Paul doesn't write anything about how God hasn't chosen lots of other people. He just says, God did choose you. Putting it another way, people say, can I choose God? Is it really just, am I some pawn in God's game? God chose me and I didn't really choose him. No, you choose God. And as soon as you've chosen him, you look back and you think, man, that was a really good decision. I wouldn't have made it unless God had chosen me. So if you're not a Christian, choose is the message. And if you are a Christian, the message is look back and praise God that you were chosen to be able to choose in the first place. But don't overcomplicate it. This is amazing stuff, and it gets better. He doesn't just say you're predestined, chosen, uh, uh, and, and so on. He says you're adopted. Adopted as sons of God through Jesus Christ. Again, this is helpful because I've got friends who were adopted who are still working through the feeling that I was rejected by my parents. Why did they give me away? Listen, adoption's no bad thing. In Roman law, being adopted didn't make you less valuable than a natural born heir. It actually made you more valuable. You could disinherit your own son, but if you'd adopted someone, you couldn't unadopt them. God isn't using this to say you're second rate. He's using the word adopted to mean you were chosen. I made you my child. And Here's a, just an interesting little historical f fact. There'd been five Roman emperors up to the time that Paul wrote this, this letter. Emperor Augustus, who was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. The Emperor Tiberius, who was the adopted son of Augustus. 
the emperor who came next, Caligula, who was the adopted son of Tiberius. Then there was Claudius, he wasn't adopted. And then the fifth one, Nero, who was the adopted son of Claudius. Five emperors so far in world history, when Paul writes this letter, four of them adopted. When Paul's saying you were adopted by God, he's not saying you're kind of added to the party later. He's saying you have been made rulers with God. You have been made the people of God. It is amazing. It changes your whole life. Just the last bit. You've been made sons in Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. It's like the baptism of Jesus. God booms from heaven. This is my son whom I love. With him I'm really pleased. It's just reflected in this verse. Just as God said that over Jesus, Paul wants us to understand when God looks at us, sinful though we are, when God looks at you, he doesn't think, what a lousy week. How dare they sing worship in front of all these people? What a hypocrite. He doesn't think that at all. He thinks forgiven in Jesus Christ. Saints, my pleasure and will. Finally, what kind of purpose? Well, no surprises. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he's freely given us in the one he loves. It's all about God's glory. It's all about God's grace. It's all about God looking great. I am really glad that Church of Christ the King isn't better than it is. I really am. It's a good church. It's not a perfect church, and I'm so glad. Perfect churches don't get used by God because when they achieve lots of things, they look back and they say, well, it's because we're so good. No, God uses rubbish churches and churches that admit they're rubbish because then the glory goes to God's grace, doesn't it? I mean, I, I don't like sinning, but I'm almost grateful for some of my sins because I look back on them and I think, do you know what? It just reminds me this is all about God and not about me. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't like losing. I'm, I'm a really sore loser. I might as well admit it. I hate it. But, you know, some of the things that I failed at in life, I'm really grateful I did because they make me look back and say, do you know what? I really can't do this. If anything happens through my life, it's all about God and not about me. Why? Because Paul says this is what characterizes churches that change the world. Glorious grace for his glory, all about him. So I want to pray and lead us in a time of communion, if that's okay. I want to help you to respond. If you're not a Christian, here's how I suggest you respond. You have just had six verses of amazing promises of how God transforms lives. I would encourage you to use this time of communion to say, God, I'm in. I've been holding back thinking you were after someone good. I've understood you're just after people who admit they're bad. I'd really encourage you, if you're not a Christian, make the most of it. And if you are a Christian, if you're part of the church even, I'd encourage you, take this, saying to God, I repent of the fact I've, I've almost devalued what we are as a church. And I take this communion saying to God, I believe you can use us. I believe you can use me. I believe you can change everything because it's to the glory of your grace. It's not about me. Let me pray.